Good morning out there. How's everybody doing? I said, how, about, how is everybody doing? That's what I like hearing. See, I, I walked in the uh, second service here, and, um, you know, I saw my section, really, you know, a bunch of, I call them wild childs like me, you know what I'm saying? So I went over there and addressed them and said, you guys got to be loud and proud today. And so that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you. That scared me. <laughs> hey, I just want to take a second. And uh, I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege this truly is. You know, it's an honor and an absolute privilege just to be able to be able to present the word for you guys today. For you guys just to hear a little piece of what God's done in my own life. But, you know, really the true honor and privilege is, is to be standing on a stage where two of the greatest pastors I've ever known have held the platform and the stage for so long and led such an amazing church. Can we give it up for Pastor Dylan and Pastor Selena real quick? It truly is a blessing and an honor just to stand here where you guys have led for, so, for a few years now. And so, anyways, we've been in a sermon series called Seek. And so um, at this time, I want, you, I want to encourage you. I hope you're taking notes. I hope you got a pen. I hope you got a piece of paper because if you're standing out or you're sitting out there and you think this is a spectator sport and you're supposed to be analyzing or, or judging how well I do or the worship does, you've missed the point of coming to church. And so I hope you have a pen this morning. I hope you have a piece of paper ready to take notes and let God speak to you. And I hope the only thing that you, that you have to say when you leave this is that God spoke to you. You don't have like, you know, a, 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 any sort of analyzation of the, the sermon or the message or the, the presenter of the message. It's about what's in the, in the gospel that I'll be talking about today that I want you to leave talking about. And so we're in a sermon series called Seek. And so if you're going to write notes, I encourage you to write down the, uh, the addresses that I teach and preach out of today. And then maybe a couple one-liners if they're in there for you, okay? And so we are going to, uh, in the sermon series Seek, our, our theme verse has been Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13. And so I would write that address down, and I would encourage you to study some of that on your own time, of course. And so let's talk about this real quick. It says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. In those days when you pray, I will listen. And the verse 13 says this. It says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. And so I want to talk about that just a little bit because that, that word wholeheartedly is really something that I feel like um, in our society, in our culture, it is something that nobody is truly all in, all in, in anything anymore. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like everybody has this like uh, plan B or this escape route or this way not to have like, you know, mud flipped in their face if they back out of what they're doing. Do you know what I'm saying? They've always got kind of one foot out the door and one foot in the door. Relationships, jobs, or, or rela you know, anything. Churches, or I'm just church hopping. I've been to 14 churches in a year. And, you know, they never really have full-hearted commitment into anything anymore. That way that if anything falls apart at any moment, they can turn and blame everything and everybody else, everything and everybody else for what has happened. And so in this verse, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. You will find me. What does that look like inside of your own life? What does it look like if you actually took your heart and placed it back into something wholeheartedly again? What would that look like if you took your whole heart and committed yourself to the gospel wholeheartedly? I got a story I'm going to tell you before I go into my message. Um, I'm meeting with some, or I was, truly I was talking with them on the phone. So I'm talking with this person on the phone, you know, meeting with them. And we're talking about uh, their disciplines, spiritual disciplines. We're talking about their, their, their you know, they, they overcommit to, to, to things. And then all of a sudden, a season later, they, they can't follow through with anything. And, and the first thing to go is always the things of spiritual natures, you, right? It's the first thing to go when your schedule's busy or when life is hectic or, or when job's pressing or when everything else around you is really hectic and really busy. The first thing that we back away from are the things of a spiritual nature. We don't get as involved with the church or we, we stop doing our spiritual disciplines and we stop doing this. And, and this was his answer. And I think it'll, it'll probably ring true to a little bit of my family here, uh, a little, you know, a little bit of my family here today. This was his answer to me is I just am so busy with this new job, this promotion at work I've got. I'm so busy with it. And I go, oh, praise God. That, that's awesome. Wow. And this is what's crazy. I go, hey, you remember last season? You remember last season when you were crying because you couldn't pay bills? And me and you went to the throne room and prayed about that? Isn't that real funny that God's the first one you kick out of the corner once you get the promotion? We're not wholeheartedly into anything. We're not wholeheartedly into anything. And so today I want to talk about this as personal prayer. 
I want to go into personal prayer, and that'll be my title for today if you're going to write notes, is personal prayer time. Today I want to dig into your personal prayer, your disciplines, and what it means to have a personal prayer life. And so personal prayer is, is different than we've covered corporate prayer. Personal prayer is what you do alone when nobody's looking. Your personal prayer is between you and God. It's that intimate personal relationship time. You know, I liken it a lot to a, a marriage. It's a relationship. You know those conversations that a husband and a wife only have, that they have alone and they have together? Those are those kind of conversations that you need to have with you and the Father. Yeah, those are those conversations that you do inventory of the heart, the contents of your heart. You have that personal prayer time for you and the Father. Here's my focus today as I throw it up. It's a quote by Martin Luther. If you know who he is, if not, it don't really matter. It's a good quote. And so the focus of today is to be Christian without prayer. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible to be alive without breathing. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. I'm just going to let that sink in for us. I, I see a lot of kind of heads taking notes. If you want to snap a picture, you want to write that down, I don't care what you do. But to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible to be alive without breathing. If I stood up here and told you guys that, well, I'm going to stay alive, but I'm not going to quit breathing right now. <gasps> I'd get a bunch of laughs and think I was stupid, and then eventually somebody would try to make me breathe. Because it's not possible. It's not possible to stay alive, nor is it possible to stay a Christian, to stay in your walk and development in the process of building a relationship with Christ without some sort of communication and it was some sort of actual relationship with the Father. I want to take a second here and I want to pray now. And so what I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes for me and we're going to talk to him. So before we talk to him, I want you to think of two things. As your eyes are closed, you're not looking at me, you're not looking around, don't be distracted. Doesn't matter if your neighbor's moving, talking, whatever. Close your eyes and get, get alone in that quiet place, the secret place inside of you, right here. Number one, I want you to, to think about who we're about to talk to. We're about to talk to God. The one that's responsible for the very breath that you breathe. The one that's responsible for the very creation in which we live in. He is our creator, you are the creation. We are his artwork in this life. And then number two, I want you to start thinking of inventory inside of your wholehearted, all your, your disciplines. What wholeheartedly have you given to the Lord? Is your prayer life wholeheartedly his? Father, Abba, Abba, Dad, 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 we need you today. Daddy, I, I need you to show up and be everything that I, I'm not capable of being. God, I need you to, to speak truth to the very hearts of the people in this room. I need you to take a word and, and get past the layers of callousness, the layers of anxiety, the layers of fear, the layers of church and knees that we teach ourselves, the auto responses that we teach ourselves to, to layer our hearts, to, to cover us up, to not be exposed. If we can put on an act long enough for people that they'll believe it. But it's not about putting on an act for people. It's about our Father sees us in secret. What is that piece of our heart, God, that we've not fully given to you. God, what does it require for us to go wholeheartedly into a relationship with you today? God, I pray for an anointing to fall on this place. I pray for a clarity of speech, a discernment that, that, that can say when to, when to go, but when to stay, Father God. The ability to present this message on soft hearts, but in a way that wrecks people as well, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, all my believers said, amen. amen. All right, so our title is Personal Prayer. We talked about our focus with Martin, Martin Luther, and now I want to talk about this. In my life, I spent uh, a good majority of, of from pretty much 12 years up to about mid-20s, okay, late 20s, completely on this journey of self-discovery. I was, trying to, I was trying to seek this life. Everything I did was seeking out what this life had to offer. That way I could find stuff to fill the God-sized void on the inside of me. Our creator, our father, you know, it even says in Jeremiah that, that he knew us before we were in our mother's womb. 
Like he knew you before you were in your mother's womb. So he placed something so unique inside of you, a, a spiritual DNA inside of you, that when you came to this earth, that you have a God-sized void on the inside of you, that the only way to satisfy that is by perfect communion and relationship with him. The problem is, is we are stuck in a culture and a society that teaches us that we are to seek satisfaction in this plane and out of people, out of places, out of jobs, out of churches, out of ministry, out of everything else. We are to seek satisfaction and affirmation from people. From how many Facebook likes can I get? How many people follow me? How many people told me I did good? Or how many people think I drive a nice car? Or how many people think that this, this coat looks nice on me today? I know. I dressed a little fancy today. Deal with it. So, but the truth is, why do we do those things? Because we do look for a certain amount of affirmation and confirmation through people. We, are, we have a God-sized void on the inside of us that can only be satisfied and taken care of with this relationship the problem with my life bc before christ okay but my problem with my life is i did this is i went through every plane around me every job every circumstance every business every relationship and i placed the demands and expectations that god built inside of my dna inside of my spiritual dna i placed those demands on relationships and when they couldn't satisfy that longing and satisfaction that was only intended for me to get out of, from God, I blamed them and I, I left. I burned it all down. I placed the, those expectations on leaders above me, right? I placed those expectations on the church that I grew up, grew up in. I, 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 my, my version of what I thought God was was based on how the church treated me. On how leaders in the church treated me. My, the satisfaction, what I was designed to have, God satisfied inside of my soul, inside of who I am, my spirit. I tried to make other people pay that. So I'm here to tell you your personal prayer, that, that communion, that relationship, just as a, a, a marriage where a relationship has no communication. You know, if you, if you go home and tell your spouse that, okay, I'll talk to you next month for an hour. It ain't going to work out. We are designed in relationship with each other very similar to the way that God has designed us to be with him. We are to spend daily time with our loved ones, with our people. Let me go into my theme verse. Matthew 6, 6, please. If you're writing notes, I would write this address down as well. That's a couple different addresses now. I would study these things out on your own time. What I would do is a couple things. Number one is this is the context that I've prayed about and studied and, and we're preaching out of today. But you have what's called a little bit of pretext, a little bit of verses before this. This is the context I'm preaching out of today. And then you have also what's called a little post text. And so if you take this verse home and study it on your own time, go to the pretext Go to the context I'm preaching, and then go to the post text around this. That way you can take a paintbrush and paint an accurate picture of what the gospel is truly saying through this message. I may be able to preach in a manner that, that motivates or excites you or convicts you because of the Holy Spirit's here. Or, or maybe you think it's a stupid message. I don't know what it is. But whatever you're thinking, it won't last. It won't create transformation unless you learn to take this information out on your own time and get a hunger and a thirst for it to study it. Okay, it doesn't matter the kind of revelation that you can get in this place will not last if you do not do this discipline on your own time. Matthew 6, 6 says this. It says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees you, sees everything, will reward you. Hmm. Amen, huh? So if you know much about Matthew 6, chapter 6 here, you go from 6, and then so 6, 7, 6, 8 would be a little post text out of what I'm talking about today, right? Okay? So I would encourage you to go study this, but 6, 9 is really something I just want to talk a little bit about. I'm not going to throw it up because I want to talk about it, and I don't want to lose your attention. But 6, 9 does this. It gives us a model, okay? If anybody in here knows, it's the Lord's Prayer, okay? And it starts out like this. Our Father. Our Father, Right? It says, our Father in heaven. And so who is this saying, our Father in heaven? Who's saying it to us? Who's telling us this? Our Father in heaven. Who says that? It's Jesus, right? It's Jesus saying this, right? And so I want to do an example. I'm going to pick on you, Rick. Rick, come on up and stand right here for me. And I'm going to do, a, I'm going to do an example for us real quick. Can I have that Bible real quick, Rick? All right, cool. So 
Rick, this is not Rick's Bible anymore. It's now my Bible. Okay, this is my Bible. You can go and have a seat. Thank you. I appreciate it. No, I'm just kidding. Stay right there. I'm just kidding. All right, so this right here for this example, I'm taking Rick's Bible, and I'm going to call it my Bible. Okay, my Bible. This is my Bible. I have exclusive rights to this Bible. Okay, I own this thing. I have access to everything within its power inside of this Bible. It's my Bible. What if I take that, that statement right there and take the word my out, and I say our, our. If I say this is our Bible, what happens? We both have equal exclusive rights to what this Bible offers. There's, it's not 5248. It's not 6040. It's our Bible. Jesus himself, when teaching you and I how to pray, what did he say? Our Father, you got to know your place in the kingdom. you got to know your place as a son and daughter of the Most High. When you go into your prayer closet, you've got to understand this isn't my Father. This is our Father, and his own son said that to you. That's the way you pray. That could be the end of the message. That could be it. You guys could leave with that alone. But he took what was mine and made it our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Right? That is how he taught us to pray, is to pray with authority to what he's given us. It's equal access to the Father. Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you, Rick. Let's give it up for Rick real quick. That word, our Father in heaven, that idea of Abba, Abba Father. Uh, you know, the Old Testament is, is, is flooded with all these other names for God and these descriptions and personalities of God. And every one of them describe a, a beautiful piece of God, a beautiful aspect of who he is. But the one word that surpasses them all, the one word that takes all of those descriptions and wraps it up beautifully in language that you and I need to digest today is Abba. Abba, Father. It takes every description of who God is, and it wraps it up in, in a blanket that's just like me yelling out, Daddy. Daddy. Abba, Father. Our Father. That word Father means he is yours and mine equally with his sons. Abba, Father. So I got this cute story I'm going to tell you. So I got two sons. Carter's my oldest, and he, he's a rocket scientist already. He's nine. And so he's the smartest kid I've ever known. He plays with Rubik's Cubes and way smarter than me already. It's scary. But um, anyways, my second son is Wyatt. And uh, if you know Wyatt, um, he's a lot like his daddy. He is just a fireball. I mean, he is full of energy, and he is going to walk into any crowd and talk to anybody at any time and, and sometimes maybe say stuff he shouldn't. You know what I'm saying? He's kind of that kid. And so forgive me if that happens today. All right, so this is what happens a lot of times with Wyatt. And so one day... Uh, you know, before I knew Christ, him and, my, him and his mom, uh, we were married, and we had the kids. And so I come home, and she's got to go, and she's going to do stuff. And so I, I walk into the house, and, and Wyatt's up on the shelf. And this is a, like a five-foot-high shelf, and, you know, he's a few years old. So he climbs up to the top shelf, and, and so she did hair at that time. And so she had a money bag full of money, right? And so that's what hairstylists get, and, you know, they get paid cash a lot. And so he climbs up on this top shelf. And I just come in. I think, oh, that's super cute. Get down. Let's, you didn't hurt nothing, right? And so and I go to the bathroom, and, and I walk into the bathroom, and I, I go to use the toilet like, like people do in the bathroom. And I look in the, in the stall or in the toilet, and it was 50s and 100s just ripped up. Whole bag of money. I mean, just ripped up. It had to be. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how much it was at this point in my life, obviously. Uh, you know, that, that's why it for you. All right? That's why it for you. And he goes, look, Dad, look what I did. Mom don't have to go back to work no more. She doesn't have to worry about what she always brings home. And that's his perception of, well, she doesn't need it. I'll rip it up. We don't need it anymore, right? So anyways, this same Wyatt is my wild child, as I call him. And so, you know, as a father does, Wyatt uh, has such an imagination and so, such energy levels like I do. His imagination runs wild, you know? And so he had crazy dreams sometimes. He would just have the, the craziest and depth dreams, and, and they would literally just rock him out of his sleep. And, and you know, borderline night terror sometimes. You, you know, we all know. It happens to some people. And so he would, he would do this. It would be 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. It would be pitch dark in the place, and all I would hear is, Daddy! And I would jump out of bed, and I'm taking off running like I'm a track star down the hall. Like, you know, I don't know what's going on. You wake up in dead sleep, and you hear Daddy screaming. I'm off. I'm running. I'm going. Whatever it takes for me to get there as quick as I can. I'm getting to my son, and I'm, what's going on? What's going on? Oh, I just had a dream. All right. And so one time it happens, and it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't forget it, you know. And I hear, 
Daddy! And I ran hard, 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 and I get there, and, and he's sitting there real cute like looking at me, and he goes, hey, just, just wanted to see if you were coming. <laughs> and I sat there in that moment, and I realized, yeah, I'm always coming when you, when you cry, Daddy. How much more does our father crave us to scream out, Abba, Dad, the way that he built me to love my son is a drop in the bucket the way that he loves you. It's a drop in the bucket to the sprint that I had at 3 in the morning to, Daddy, it's a drop in the bucket to the relationship that he craves to have with you. He's built us this way to have relationships because that's how we are designed after our creator. I want to go into my own personal uh, disciplines here, um, and I want to talk about what God has done through and in my own personal disciplines life, but I need to put a disclaimer on this. Number one, I'm not saying this information to impress you or think that I'm holy as thou, okay? I have, um, I have absolutely nothing to brag about in this life because everything in my best efforts before I knew Jesus Christ, I wrecked. I ruined it. I hurt people. I ruined relationships. I did nothing of true value on my own efforts. And so this is the process that God has done in and through me in order to take me from the death that I was to the life that he chooses to have through me now. Okay? And so this is the process that we have done, me and God, together. So my morning routine looks like this. If you're taking notes, I hope you take some notes. I'm not saying you got to do exactly what I do, but what I'm saying is I hope you, I can motivate some imagination, something to crave, something deeper with you and God in your relationships and your spiritual disciplines. So... In my morning time, I set aside one hour. Every morning, I set aside one hour for me to get a loan in my war room. I have an office set up with two desks. It's, you know, one, two. One's work. One's all just prayer and, and writing and journaling. That's all I do on it. And so at this desk, I have uh, my morning time set aside. I do put on worship music. I like having worship music on. And also, I do something else that's called scribing. And so scribing is, I take a, a chapter of Psalms or Proverbs. Psalms is kind of known as more of the prayer book. You know, it, it, the whole thing is just beautiful prayer language. And you'll find everything in Psalms from the best and best of good things to the darkest and darkest of dark things. You can find everything that we would ever deal with, life and death and everything in between that, relationships and everything else inside of Psalms into a prayer language. And so what I do with my first hour is I write out a chapter of Psalms or Proverbs to get my mind meditating on the things of Christ. You know, because that's one of the biggest things as I hear is people can't focus long enough. I get distracted. Well, that, that is exactly the culture that we lived in, that we live in. We live in an over-impulse society. Everything is, is, is bargaining for our attention and for, for us to pay attention and, and, and get online or get on our phone. And so in the mornings, I write a whole chapter of Psalms or Proverbs. And then after that, I review my, my prayer wall and my vision plan. So at my desk that I have set up, I've got my cork board right here. And if you were here a couple Saturdays ago, I revealed this to a, a short little crowd of us. But I've got probably 50 to 100 intimate personalized prayers wrapped up on that cork board. And so after I write my Psalms or my Proverbs, I have a, an obedience to go, and thank, go through and thank God for the things that he's done in my life. My number one thing that I put in the middle of my cork board, because this, this was the process of me uh, really being humbled, okay? This is the first prayer that I start with in the middle of my cork board every morning. As I wake up and I pray for my boys' mother and her husband. Because the world teaches us that, that, that that's, that's not a relationship that can be fixed, so that, that we can't have a working, healthy relationship. So the first thing I do every morning is I wake up and I pray for Chris, her husband, and Summer, my children's mom. I say, in the name of Jesus, please, Lord, just touch Chris and Summer's marriage, that he would love her the way a, a woman deserves to be loved. Number two, I pray for Nicholas, their son. And then I pray for my children. And then everything from that place where my heart begins getting postured correctly to the creator, everything from that place, we go from spiritual things to ministry things to, to leadership teams to finances and, and business things. And, and so then I walk through all my other prayers at that time. Number two, in the afternoon, that's what this looks like. We have a minimum of, I have a minimum of one hour of car rides every day. It's just my schedule. And I want to park on the car ride topic just real quick for you guys. If you can raise your hand and try to tell me, and you don't have to, but that, that your car rides are your, no, oh, that's when I get my prayer time in. 
It's hogwash. Your car rides are what you have to do to go earn a paycheck. That time is already set aside to get you where you have to go for your personal responsibilities. A, a proper spiritual disciplined life is so, a time that you set aside that sacrifices your comforts and you give that time to God to get into his presence. Because his sacrifice for us on the cross, it deserves us getting up just a little earlier and etching out some time to get into his presence. You see, I'm talking to somebody in here because some people come up and they go, well, I feel legal legalistic having time set aside and stuff like that. But the truth is, you know, most of the people that want to come up and say, oh, you, you set a clock for an hour? That's legalistic. No, the truth is, is you're not willing to actually change your habits, so you want to talk about mine. This is just what's worked for me in my life. But if you have habits that surpass this, then you should be okay with me talking about them. Because my car rides are uh, pretty much prayer time for me and my family. I've got my cards in there. And then the evening, that's what this looks like. A minimum of 30 minutes where I flip a chapter. And so what I do is, I, I, this is my quiet time at the end of the night. I try to, to digress and process everything that's happened. I, I get quiet in front of God. And so at the beginning of January, what I do is I start in Genesis. And then I'll flip a chapter every night and just do one chapter of Bible reading, real simple Simon stuff, until I get to the end of the Bible. But then I also have 30 minutes of just quiet time where I'm completely listening for the voice of God. No phone, no sounds, no technology. I'm completely listening for the voice of God. And that is my actual spiritual discipline right there. I just want to take a second as you write down. I want everybody just to close their eyes and let's pray one more time. Before I try to bring this home, we're going to start to do worship in a second. God, I thank you. Hmm. I feel like you've got a special word prepared right here for somebody. Lord, I know that in this message, God, it's, it's uncomfortable. And it could be a little bit painful thinking about maybe I'm a comfortable, casual Christian. So God, as we think about our focus this morning, our focus is this. It is no more possible to be a Christian without prayer than it is to be alive without breathing. So God, this morning, I just want to give the ability, give the ability for some people in here to start doing inventory inside of their hearts, inside of who they are, God, that you would begin convicting them on areas of their lives that they could begin giving, begin, no, begin giving to, um, just begin sacrificing and giving over to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Look, I want to bring up a couple more scriptures real quick before we close. We want to go into Luke 6, 12, and I want you to give you a, a couple scriptures to support my morning and evening and so i hope you're writing these these verses down so in luke 6 12 it says one day soon afterward jesus went up on a mountain to pray and he prayed to god all night all night when's the last time you were burdened so heavily all night long when's the last time that you went into prayer all night long when is the last time that you etched aside time in the morning and the evening to be alone with god it is no more possible to be a Christian without prayer than to be alive without breathing. What are you filling your time with? Luke 11, 9 through 10 says this also. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you asked for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be open. I want to invite you to stand at this time. We're going to go into a time of worship. And I just want to talk to you guys just for a minute or two before we even do a response time. But if you would, just close your eyes with me. I want to talk to your hearts right now. Lord, anoint this moment, God. I can feel that you have a tugging and a word for somebody in here, Lord. I want you to think about what you do with your time. I want you to think about your personal prayer time in here. I want you to think about your disciplines. I want you to think about this, family. All the blessings that he's put in you and given in your life, your family, your home, your job, your, your kids, your every, all the things that he's blessed you with. How do you honor him with what he's done for you? 
Or is the season you're living in, is it the fruit of your prayers from last season, but you've abandoned your, your quiet time, your prayer time with God? Why is it God is the first one to suffer whenever we get busy? Why is it our relationship with him is the first thing that we abandon when things start getting better? It's no more possible to be a Christian without prayer than to be alive without breathing. This time of the service is set aside for response. No matter where you are, family, no matter where you are right now, no matter your relationship with Christ, we all can get a little bit better with our spiritual disciplines. We all can get a little sharper with our spiritual disciplines. We all can sacrifice a little bit more to be in the presence of God. What are you doing with what God has given you? You will be held accountable to those things one day. You will meet God and he will say to you, what did you do with what I gave you? How did you honor me with the time that I gave you? Lord, I pray. Father, I pray that people are, are, are convicted, that people are drawn out of their seats at this very moment. They begin just wanting to move toward the altar. That, God, they want to get closer to you. That, God, I lay down my comforts. God, I go into this new season. I go into this new season. There are some leaders in here. There are people in here that are supposed to be in ministry. You're supposed to be involved in this ministry, but yet you sit in the back and nobody calls you out. I'm calling you out that God is asking you to come forward and lay down your comfort and get in the game and be all in, all in. That he needs you to do what he's called you to do. It's going to require sacrifice. It's going to require obedience. Will you give? Will you give what it takes? Will you give what it takes? You had better hit these altars if he's speaking to you. He's talking to you. Today is your day. This is your moment. God is calling you as deep calls to deep to give it all unto him. This is your time to respond. I'm Selena Freeman, one of the pastors here at The Well. We are so glad you tuned in to this sermon and hope the Lord spoke to you through it. If you have any questions about the message, your faith, or a prayer request, you can visit the contact page of our website. We would love to meet you in person, so please come by and see us. At The Well, we believe that all people can be found by the grace of God, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, and freed to love like Christ. Have a blessed week, and remember, you are so very loved by our awesome God.